Good day, everyone. This is a, a different voice introducing the StreamYard for the Philadelphia Parks Alliance. Uh, welcome, I'm Alex Doty. And uh, today we have a few people here joining us from uh, our various places across the city to talk about um, what's been happening in two of my favorite parks in Philadelphia under COVID. Um, so we all know that we've been facing a, a substantial budget deficit for the city and the Parks and Recreation Department has taken a $12.5 million hit to uh, its budget under COVID at the same time as um, we've also seen unprecedented demand for both uh, the rec centers and being able to access them and our parks. Um, and the challenges that that's brought for maintenance, um, but also some of the longer term challenges of um, what, how do we maintain open space within the city of Philadelphia and how do we have uh, equitable access to these spaces. So really looking forward to a conversation about that. Um, so let me bring on uh, Ruffian from the Friends of the Wissahickon. Um, welcome Ruffian. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me today. And then also excited uh, to be able to talk with uh, Maitre from Bartram's Garden, um, which is, uh, I, I don't think that we can call Bartram's Garden a hidden gem anymore. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Nice. Thanks for having me. Uh, and then um, we also have the Philadelphia Parks Alliance Program Director, Lula DeFersho. Um, so you know, we were interested in trying to bring you guys together when we were having some conversations about what it's like to try and manage um, park space under COVID. And we've been working so hard to get people to come out to our parks and to our spaces. And now um, we kind of have a problem of how do we manage all these people in our <laughs> parks and in our open spaces. Um, so Ruffy, why don't you talk a little bit about what it's been like to be trying to manage the Wissahickon under COVID. Sure. Well, first I have to, um, you know, say that friends, the friends of the Wissahickon partner strongly with parks and recreation. So we're not in it alone, um, but it has been a challenge. Um, the Wissahickon's always been incredibly popular and we, we typically see peak use in the summertime as you'd expect, but we've ha been having endless summer since about March 15th. So, um, with, and, as, as you said, Alex, you know, we've been saying for years, come on outside, get outside. We need to get our kids outside. And um, everybody's outside now and needs to be outside, loves to be outside. Uh, but like I say in the Wissahickon, it's for everyone. We don't have parking for everyone, unfortunately. And so uh, really thinking about how are we providing great information to people to plan their visits, uh, understand what kind of space they're going to encounter when they come. Um, if it's a first time visitor, the word park means to some people a big open lawn with pavilions and barbecues and big parking lots and some shade, but not necessarily a forest that you might encounter more in a backcountry experience. So um, those are some of the challenges that we've seen just tremendous use for a sustained period of time that has uh, really put some pressure on our ability to manage basic amenities, trash, bathrooms, uh, parking lots, and balancing the expectations of longtime visitors who have a, a typical experience they're used to having that has now for many months been, as I said, the endless summer of uh, tremendous visitation. So those are, those are some of the, the tip of the iceberg challenges that we've had, I should say. Um, and Maitre, what, what does this time look like for Bartrams? Well, similarly, it's been incredibly busy. It's wonderful actually to have uh, visitors that have never come to the garden uh, come during this time. Uh, however, the uh, sort of pressing demands of care and upkeep, uh, especially following the COVID requirements for distancing and so on, has put a lot of strain on the staffing to keep up the garden. Um, it's still a really uh, important time to have the conversations with new visitors about 
um, open space, green spaces, and what they mean in this uh, amidst the pandemic. So those are the conversations that are bubbling up at the garden. Um, we have been very focused on making sure that our farm continues to provide food for the community. So we were able to, as an essential function, continue the operations at the farm, the Sankofa Community Farm. We were also really um, interested in uh, and committed to keeping the 50 uh, summer internships that we provide for our local community, the high school students going. So we had to uh, really juggle a lot to figure out how to um, turn a hands-on program into a distanced and uh, virtual summer internship. So that's been like consuming, um, I think, for the staff. Um, that's, it's in some ways though, put a focus on how important public spaces are um, and especially at this time. And I think this is the, the sort of the important thing to kind of seize this moment and to make more of uh, a case for how these spaces are public infrastructure. Yeah, that reminds me of a quote I was reading in an interview my trade did a few years ago. And, and one of your mantras, it said, was to uh, never waste a crisis. And, uh, <laughs> and something I've been thinking a lot about is how do we turn, you know, Again, how does how does this challenge of so many people wanting to be in these spaces? Where are the opportunities um, for not just us as stewards, but for businesses and entrepreneurs to really um, see yeah. that these open spaces can be real drivers uh, for innovation and or even just opportunity to make some money? Whether it's you know transporting visitors from a remote parking area or offering. So, you know, special experiences beyond what the the land the land steward is is doing. Um, those are just things I've been thinking about. So um, I don't know if you have any other insights on how we can not waste this crisis, but uh, <laughs> it certainly is a big one for sure. I think one of the things that um, I want our staff to focus more on in this next few months is to have more conversations with these the newer visitors that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. To do that, we've actually decided um, to open up a, a welcome center window. So we know we can't use our indoor spaces, but mm -hmm. we were able to open up a window, provide maps, uh, you know, sort of set up a hand sanitizing stations, bottle filling stations across the garden as a way to uh, kind of get a more of an engagement around what's driving people to come, what kinds of things are they excited to do at the garden and so on. So I'm hoping that in the next few months, we have a better sense of sort of who all have discovered us in this pandemic and how we keep their interest going. So I feel like that's an important aspect to these next few months. I think um, one of the things that COVID has taught all of us, I'll say, is how to be creative, like you were saying Rakan, earlier how to be creative in our approach of the new normal that we are facing. I know you both have a large volunteer groups that you have worked with previously, and now you have new influx of new people who are visiting your, your, your area more than ever. How do we, and maybe this is just a brainstorming opportunity, but how, and people who are watching, please comment and let us know if you have opinions as well, but how do we engage this new, normal where we have so many people come into these parks and open spaces and also manage our volunteer groups who have been doing cleanups for so many years and have created so many different programs around engaging both worlds. So I'm just curious to know, have you thought about that or what that process looks like moving forward? So for the friends, I mean, the uh, figuring out how to continue to engage and, and deliver volunteer uh, service has been a real challenge. Uh, we had a whole model plotted out for this year that really ramped up the size of our volunteer days that the public was coming to. And then all of our trained volunteers work really closely together. And a lot of that training happens inside. And so 
we really just had to take a pause to figure out, I think like everyone, what what are we allowed to do under guidelines? What do we as an organization feel is best practice? And then ultimately volunteers are not obligated to do anything. So then assessing the interest and, and comfort level of our volunteers has been really important. I think now we're ready, we'll be uh, launching more public work days in a smaller scale model. So under really under 25, probably capped out around eight or 10 um, with some remote training and then uh, you know, advanced registration and everything that's much more uh, scheduled down to the minute than, than we used to be. Uh, and we're happy to be able to get back in the field. We really, once we're really back out with these public days, don't wanna have to um, retreat again. So really safety, best practices uh, is, is what we're focusing on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similarly at the garden, I think um, the interesting thing with the uh, uptick in visitation is that people want to contribute. So we are really figuring out all of the rules around that we can make sure that um, we are sort of being, you know, applying the right precautions. But the idea of bringing in volunteers is really. Um, Absolutely, absolutely an imperative. We need the support. The visitation has sort of created more demands for maintenance. And uh, I want to, I mean, the volunteers are absolutely critical. So for us, um, we're also looking into the model that the Conservancy, Fairmont Park Conservancy has been um, sharing with, you know, solo volunteering, mm -hmm when you're at the garden, you know, providing you with the tools to help us keep the garden going is, is an option we're looking at. And much like Ruffian, you're really looking at uh, small dedicated volunteer groups, looking at ensuring that tools don't get shared, that there's uh, sort of good practices for cleaning up uh, tools and things like that. Those uh, practicalities I'm realizing take a lot of time and effort, just making sure that you're uh, following all and the money. <laughs> time and effort, like it's all in there. And so uh, that's been a really important thing. However, I do think it's an opportunity to bring in new volunteers. I think people want to contribute when they come and enjoyed something. Uh, they feel like uh, more of a connection to the space. So it's an opportunity to really bring them back in some new ways. So I think it's a, a good practice to bring in back, bring back volunteers, but also they become an advocate for you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Maitre, one of the things that Bartram's has been devoted to over the last number of years is getting those advocates for the park from the neighborhood mm -hmm. surrounding the park. And mm -hmm. I think that that you, you have a real, you, I think there was a moment there when we're like, Hey, great. The school river trail is coming to Bartram's garden. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment there when Bartram's reflected on what is it that we want this place to be. And, you're in a neighborhood that's been cut off from the river. Um, and is this simply the extension of center city people getting to come down to Bartram's garden or, or, or is the place going to be something more than that? So can you talk a little bit about what have you, what are the projects that you've undertaken to try and increase that community engagement? That's a great question. I think with the Schuylkill River Trail inching closer to Bartram's, uh, we've, as a board and staff, been very focused on ensuring that our local community, our immediate neighbors that have not necessarily seen the garden as its um, civic space, be really engaged in the notion that this is their family room, you know, this is sort of the neighborhood's family room, this is the classroom for the community. So the last four years, we've five, four, five years, we've been really focused in on a lot. Of, I would say it sort of comes down to relationship building, really um, word of mouth, um, going door to door. We have a lot of street teams that we hire to put the word out for specific programs. And now I think we've 
had enough of a, a track of engagement that we are able to really program with the community, not necessarily program for the community. So a lot of our programming is um, reflecting back in some ways Southwest artists, Southwest music, Southwest food and culture. Um, so one of the things that's really at the heart of this is to ensure that when the garden becomes a destination for those on trails, that there is a home base of, uh, of our immediate community that is attached to the garden in the long term. I'm not worried about people finding us on the Schuylkill Trail, they will find us. Trail users find every spot that they can go to on a bike. So I'm much more concerned about how the trail becomes an opportunity for Southwest residents mm -hmm. to actually reach out into the city, go to museums, go to restaurants, go to jobs, go to healthcare, that now is like 20 minutes, going to be 20 minutes away for them. So how does the garden become a gateway for the Southwest uh, to nature and so on, but also to access all of these other things that have otherwise seemed too far. So that's been a big focus for us. Um, I'm hoping that down the road we can have bikes at the garden that people could pick up and then go into the city and come back. And that I think will really lend itself to being an, a real amenity, like a daily maybe even amenity for residents in the Southwest. And the trail connection is, is going to be really beautiful. So the idea that the Southwest is actually like plugged back in into what I think is one of the most beautiful park systems in the world, but the Southwest has never been plugged in. So this will be like the way for the Southwest to access the entire rest of the park system as well. So those are our aspirations and we're um, really working on relationship building with local schools, local institutions, so that they see those same opportunities as well. So Ruffian, you, you Bartram's is 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 becoming the gateway to the system. The yeah. Hickens <laughs> was there before the Schuylkill River Trail, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. um, yeah. you know, and so and so you're facing a little bit of a different challenge in terms of you know what's the what's the serve how do you serve people but how do you preserve mm -hmm. that space mm -hmm. yeah um, and and just the scale of the you know the wissahickens 1800 acres it's very in most places really uh porous into the neighborhoods uh we do have yeah. some kind of hard walls uh that i'm not particularly thrilled about down in the southern end that kind of cut off um Germantown from the Wissahickon as far as Lincoln Drive being there, but that's something that we're continuing to think about. How do we, how do we make a better connection in that area? Um, but we're just seeing, you know, that love, that great intensity to be outside um, all over the Wissahickon. Of course, our, our main kind of heart of the park is the Valley Green area and um, tremendous uh, visitation coming through both access roads there. There's so many ways to enter the park that one of the things we're really hoping to get more information out there is that there, there are other ways to get in. There's um, not huge parking lots anywhere. So also trying to provide people with information about how you can access the Wissahickon either by the, the greater trail system or through public transportation. Uh, but it is it's definitely, we're not lacking for visitors. Um, and, and we're thrilled to see people out there. I, I loved Maitre's uh, talking about uh, having some sort of welcome center or welcome window. And I'm picturing little little welcome uh, boxes all over the Wissahickon um, at some point with those bottle fill stations and, and a better way to move people through the space. Because again, I think for a lot of visitors, especially first time visitors, the word park means a certain a certain level of amenity may be there. And um, as you mentioned, Alex, we've, you know, the PPR's budget is certainly under, always under strain and has been cut. So um, 
there's real challenges for just those basic amenities like bathrooms, um, which then yeah. present other challenges for a space mm -hmm. when people are out there for many hours. Mm -hmm. So, um, but looking towards the future, I mean, we're th thrilled to have better connections to all of to the greater trail system of Philadelphia and hopefully find ways to provide people with better information before they come, whether it's data on how uh, crowded parking lots are or where you're gonna find bathrooms at what intervals and actually have them there and have them clean and serviceable. Um, and also uh, better access to maps. Again, it's 1800 acres, a lot of people come in. Um, and if you get, and it's even happened to me, you kind of get yourself turned around and all of a sudden you're not quite sure which ways, which way you need to be going and, and um, how to find your way out. So, you know, better wayfinding information uh, for, for phones uh, that people can use to, to navigate the park. So we're, we do have some exciting things coming out soon that, that should help with that. That's exciting to hear um, because we're still unsure of how COVID is playing out with everything that we um, are experiencing. So, and the more that we are in the house, I think our outlet has been, like you said earlier, the parks and open space and being to experience outdoors. So what better way to, how can people access the information that you're talking about or how to look for um, look for the maps or um, just information about? Yeah, well, access. I'm happy to do a plug for um, our website, <laughs> fow.org. And we have a whole section on maps where you can, actually we've created a custom Google map that tells you where all of the um, alternate parking locations are, what amenities you might find, which right yeah. now, I, you know, really, Plan carefully because we do not have a lot of bathrooms in the Wissahickon. Um, and there's also suggested hikes uh, where you might want to start a particular trailhead head and um, how long that might take you. So there's a ton of information on our website and uh, we will also be, I am happy to announce here, this is surprise information, my staff may kill me, but we will be, um, we are going to be launching an app soon for the park and there'll be all kinds of goodies in there and it is going to be free. So um, we're really excited about that. that is and, uh, it's going to be heavily focused on that wayfinding information and, and planning your experience so that people can do it ahead of time, but also do it on the fly while they're in the mm -hmm. park. too. Steve, we need a, br a breaking news. <laughs> uh, what do they call it? A Chiron? It goes across the bottom there. <laughs> For, I don't know, Lula, do we have anyone watching? So uh, We do. We do have people watching. <laughs> That's, That's really great. exciting. Um, I think access to information is key in maintaining, protecting our open space as we try to go around and figure out how the world is moving because people want to be out. And before we were begging people to come to our parts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it's so important. And, and and Philadelphia has one of the great park systems, right? It and is. we have such a variety of landscapes throughout all, there's over 10,000 acres, people. So um, <laughs> you can have any experience you want from a, a garden, a forest, a, mm -hmm. you know, a beautifully planned open space that's got pavilions, it's all there everywhere. So yeah. um, very true. Lucky. Even golf courses. We even have golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> And more and more people are going to look for them. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Ruffian, what's something that you're, that you uh, are jealous of that you covet at, that Bartram's Garden has been able to do? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> to me, I do covet that kind of contained feeling of this is, this is the edge. This is where, where we begin and end and how we control moving people through that space because uh, it's a lot of moving parts in Lewisahickon. So um, I, I know it doesn't sound that exciting, but I do, not that I want to wall it off because I certainly don't, but just the idea that I know um, all the ways people are coming in, but I, you know, there's the designated trailheads and then people can come in anywhere because it's woods. <laughs> so uh, maybe a gate. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and 
I think that, you know, Maitre's built a great staff. Um, so I certainly covet also the size of staff that she has to, to manage the space, but which, which I'm sure does still doesn't feel like enough because these green spaces will take everything and more, you know, there's always, always more that could be done. But that is certainly something that I experience as a, as, as somebody who's, who's listening to the needs of across all the sectors of parks and rec, right? You can set up this, well, they are, they've got all that staff and it's like, no one has an <laughs> adequate number. No. You might no. have a worse number. Their number is not good enough. Right? No, it's not good enough. None of it. Um, which isn't to say that you should, you know, I'm not, and, and you can also feel neglected, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to say be happy with what you have, but yeah. nobody's got enough. Nobody does. Uh, nobody yeah. does. I, I mean, think there, there is that thread, the common thread of resource, uh, resources are really a challenge for all of us. Can I though answer the question of what I would be uh, interested in sort of um, taking from the Wissahickon? Sure. sure. And it's actually what you were just talking about, <laughs> the, the sort of focus we've had on technology, on sharing information so people can plan ahead and so on. We've not had a lot of resources to put into uh, making the garden be more uh, understandable before you arrive. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we're clearly seeing a big need for now. People come with very different expectations than what our website allows them to understand. And um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing your app and looking at it and then really seeing how we could do something um, that would help the communication, especially with new visitors. Uh, we've not intentionally, I think, focused on sort of virtual experiences. Um, and now we, you know, one of the core things that we took for granted was people could gather freely in the garden and now we can't and there are so many other rules that we have to follow so making the experience um sort of more understandable before you start your journey to the garden is something that i'm hoping to learn a few things from for you from what you're doing right now well we'll be happy to share so yeah <laughs> and I, I know you love the Wissahickon and are in there. Yeah, often, so I'll look forward to your feedback. My dog is tired of walks. He's a tiny <laughs> fellow. And every time he gets taken out for a walk, he's like, how many more times am I going to do this today? <laughs> and I'm sure. I, everybody wants a turn, right? Oh, my, the dog must need to be walked. I'll go. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. But I think <clears throat> what I love about this conversation is um, I think we're talking about the challenges that we all are experiencing, but also mm -hmm. we're sharing best practices. So I would love to have this conversation maybe next time about some best practices within our own um, organizations that mm -hmm. we can share among each other, but also invite some partner organizations as well. Sure. That would be great. That sounds, yeah. that sounds fun. Yeah. Good idea. And we all can just learn among each other. Yeah. Well, that, I think, um, you know, one of my questions was going to be, uh, what have you, what have you done differently during this kind of COVID crisis that you're going to keep with you? And I'll answer it first is just one of the things that I've been so happy about is better connections with our partners. Uh, mm -hmm. I got to know my tray through a yeah. group of partners that meets regularly and then uh, working with Alex and Lula through this time. And I hope we all continue, even if we're able to have in-person meetings, that we all continue to stay in touch this way because it seems like we're able to do it more often and, and yeah. a little more in depth, so. We'll just uh, all carry a box with us when we meet in person, <laughs> so it <it'll> looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, I would second that. I think um, also um, the not relying on the sort of walking by someone's desk or being out in the garden as a way to communicate. We've been much more intentional about keeping up with our colleagues and keeping up with the board, especially making sure they get lots of updates and information. Um, all of that has become much more part of our work and mm -hmm. I, I wanna hold on to all of that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Completely agree. Alex, yeah, go ahead, Alex. So, one of the things that I 
heard very clearly when you were talking much about the work that you've been successful with in Bartram's Garden is that to do outreach to the community, to reach communities that are not traditionally served by some of our public spaces, that's not a thing of being able to use the right words or have the right intentions. That's not enough. It requires resources to go and meet people where they are. Um, and, and now the challenge is to try and do that when we are going to be resource starved are and, and, and I think will be for the, at least the short term. Um, so I, so I lead things off with a, maybe a bit of a downer, um, but, but want to acknowledge the resources that it takes to do these things. I mean, that's been part of the theme that we've taken through this, but if you could, if you could have, uh, one thing to wish for mm -hmm. um and uh you know what what would you like to see that would help you in your work hmm. Hmm, that's a great question um what is the one thing i'd like to do um, i think i would want um I would want like my the gardens, um, the work we've been doing in the last few years to build our relationships with our community to like be much more present and part of the garden's DNA. Like I would want to um, not disrupt that. And so these are very difficult times in the Southwest. The gun violence is really, really at an all-time high. It's like really, there's so much despair around that. The COVID numbers in the Southwest are higher than most other parts of the city. And so the crisis of this pandemic with unrest and with uh, violence is what we were trying to counter at the garden. So I would want to hold on to those relationships that we've built that feel somehow more fragile now than ever. So spending more time kind of keeping those uh, threads together is sort of what I want to hold on to. I don't know if that's, maybe that's not the answer you were looking for, but that um, feels much more urgent to me than anything else. You ask an open-ended question, you, 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 you get a thoughtful answer. Yeah. Um, I, di I did not have my multiple choice thing and ready to check <laughs> off here. How, how about you, Ruffian? What's, what's something that you would hope for or what's one thing that you would like to have? One thing I would like to have. <laughs> wow, there's so many things I want. Um, yeah. You know, I think for the Wissahickon, it would be really great to have um, a defined welcome area where we could um, really provide a welcome and information and, and have a, as a hub for our staff and, and park staff to be there. It's something um, I've been thinking about and is kind of on a 10-year plan or maybe 20, I don't know. Um, but to really have that to find a uh, central main area and uh, be able to, maybe not everybody enters through that area, but really that that's the hub, a hub mm -hmm. for everything there. Because I think, well, again, one of the best things that I love about the physical aspects of the park is, is that it's porous. It's also, as I mentioned, a challenge because, you know, people are coming in from so many areas um, and, and having different experiences there. So just, and, and having one place for all of the tools and all of the equipment and everything that we all need to steward the place would be great. So a little more physical attributes uh, for our work, I think. So you'll, you'll build that building, yes. but you, you could start by building the window first, right? Yes, I can, yeah. uh, maybe it'll be like a, um, you know, modular little set that can have little moving welcome centers that can all then swoop back together into one big building, like a transformer. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> Great. Sounds like a, a shipping container, is it? Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so just wave your wand, Alex. 
<laughs> well, I can I can definitely you know go to the uh, puppet show website and get a window for you. <laughs> okay. Um, we can. I think we can start from there. Wonderful. Maybe that's what. Maybe maybe the Parks Alliance should should get a window. Yeah. Just to, we show up wherever we show up. This is your <laughs> window into the community of Parks and Rec. Um, no, that will be exciting. That will be a great TV show. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, thank both of you for joining us for this conversation. You know, yeah. at the Parks Alliance, um, we we think about the sort of three sectors of of Parks and Rec that um, that are important to us, or or and that is, you know, parks, rec centers, and open space, mm -hmm. and all of them are vital to the health of our community. Um, I think that the open space often doesn't get quite the attention um, that it needs because it's always something that can be put off a bit until tomorrow, right? The, the needs there aren't quite as pressing. And yet that overall need of having resilience to climate change is open space is such an important part of that. Um, and uh, you guys are, are doing such a, such a, a great job of, of both um, stewardship over some of the important open spaces in our city, but also going out and getting the resources that we need mm -hmm. to do this. Um, and uh, just, I know it doesn't feel like enough, but what you guys are doing is getting more resources to this than there would be if you weren't there. Um, so just want to just i think end on a on a thank you and a and a note of gratitude for for all of the work that that your two organizations do that you guys lead and that and that your staff and and especially and let's just hit this hard volunteers you know which are the which are absolutely the lifeblood of making all of our all of our work work definitely and thank you to you Alex and Lula and the team at the Parks Alliance for convening all these great conversations during this time and having a great platform for us to talk and and of course, all your great advocacy work on the <laughs> park system and recreation as well. well. We started this out uh, the, the conversation backstage is some sort of mutual admiration society. So that's 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 the way that we'll end here. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, backstage, uh, Steve Taylor, thanks again for uh, yeah. the work that you do on this all the time. And uh, we look forward to the next conversation. All right. Thank you. See you out there. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good one.